And what, what happens here in John 18? And I want to look at this together. If you'll turn in your Bibles to John 18, verse, starting in verse 12. This is just after Jesus has been arrested, just after the betrayal of Judas in his kiss to Jesus, the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews, you have several hundred people that are there, arrested Jesus and bound him and led him to Annas first, for he was a father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was expedient for one man to die on behalf of People. And so we have kind of that irony coming in, also that prophetic feeling that's also coming into this picture that it was Caiaphas, you know, let's just get rid of this guy. It's better that we just get rid of this guy than to have some huge following of him happen. Verse 15, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter was standing at the door outside. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. Verse 17. Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of the man's disciples, are you? What's interesting about this, uh, this question is it's answered expecting a negative response. Expecting a negative response. And it's almost like if you can imagine, you know, uh, young me hanging out with my the popular kids and there is Ben sitting over on the other side and the other kids are like, you're not going to hang out with Ben, are you? It's kind of like cynical. It's almost cynical in, in flavor here. You're not you're not one of his two, are you? And it almost presents in such a way where it's easier for Peter to say, well, no, no, of course not. It kind of makes it almost easier. And maybe Peter, you know, Peter's sitting here. Remember, what has Peter just done when Jesus was being arrested? Do you remember what Peter did? Peter pulled his sword and cut off the ear of one of the servants. Peter might have, I'm not, I'm not condoning what he's doing, but I'm explaining here is the situation. Peter has just, now Jesus did heal him, but Peter still did the offense, didn't he? Peter still cut off the ear of that servant. Do you think Peter might be a little bit worried about his situation too? And so when the servant girl says, you're not one of his disciples too, are you? It's easy for Peter to say, no, 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 I'm not. Just like it was kind of easy for me to say, you're not going to hang out with Ben, are you? No, that's... that's that's dumb. Why would I do that? We get set up kind of with these questions, don't we, in life? Well, you're not going to do this. Well, you're, 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 not, you're, you're not going to church, are you? You don't believe in that odd Christian stuff, do you? You know, and, and the questions continue. And it's, it's setting up in a cynical way to kind of make it easy for us to say, well, no, no, I, I know that's, that's not very smart. I, I know that's not very cool. That's I imagine, you know, kids get these kind of questions all the time. Our young ones get questions like this all the time with a cynical question being asked, making it a little more difficult for them to choose the right answer. And so it makes Peter, it makes the situation for Peter very easy for him to say, no, no, I'm not. And, and almost kind of distancing himself from the situation Kind of thinking, you know, Peter's not thinking again the ramifications of all this. He, he's probably thinking, yeah, I don't want anybody to start. Yeah, hey, here's another one of those disciples. Hey, here's that guy. And, you know, and it kind of explodes, and then all of a sudden he's being imprisoned. So verse 17, it says, Then the slave girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciple, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the officers, now these officers are probably the same officers that were there, the Jews, uh, the officers of the Jews that came to arrest Jesus. And so they're standing around here. So it's not like he's just with some, Peter's just with some random people here. He is with some people that were there when Jesus was arrested. Guess what they might have also seen? Peter with the sword. Peter wants to distance himself 
from Jesus at this point. So verse 18, he says, Now the slaves and the officers were standing there, having made a char charcoal fire, for it was cold, and they were warming themselves, and Peter was also with them standing and warming himself. Now John is setting up here a contrast. Peter is denying everything and distancing himself from everything. Jesus does the exact opposite. Verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered him and said, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together, and I spoke nothing in secret. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. Jesus is asking the right questions and responding in the right way. They're trying to know that the, the, the high priest here, Annas, is asking uh, about, uh, you know, what is Jesus teaching? Uh, he's probably asking, you know, how, how big a following do you have? What, what are you teaching about? This is not so much, I think, concerned about doctrine, but losing power and losing their following. The people that are following them, they don't want them to start following this Jesus guy. And so they start asking these questions. Now that, that fire and that warming, and we know exactly that they've just gone to the garden and it's in the middle of the night. This is something in the middle of the night that should not be happening. And it should not be happening is that they have got Jesus cornered, drilling him, interrogating him with these questions. Jesus responds and says, go get witnesses. Now under Jewish law, Jewish law... How many witnesses were needed when there, was, when there was a problem? Two, right? At least two, a minimum of two. Jesus says, hey, I know where some witnesses are. And I want you to go and find, you should go and find them. Go and ask anybody. I, I've taught freely and openly. Now some of you are thinking, yeah, but didn't he teach privately with his disciples? And that's a good question, and you're right, he did. But was there anything that he didn't teach out openly that he taught privately that was really different? Did he extrapolate? Did he explain further? I would say that the only thing that I could really find that was really different was talking about his death. That he was going to go and be on the cross, that he was going to be crucified, he was going to be murdered by Gentiles. Other than that, he kind of just further explained what he said in, in public. So it's really that he was in secret talking to. So when Jesus says this, he's not lying. But he says, go and get witnesses. Jesus is not denying anything. He's owning it by going, hey, go and find the people that are out there that heard me speak and bring them and ask them. That'll be a better testament than me just speaking from my own. Jesus said, uh, Jesus earlier in, in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, or excuse me, later after the Sermon on the Mount, says, you know, if you don't believe me and believe my words, believe what? Believe the, the signs, the miracles, because they attest to what I'm saying. So Jesus says, you're not going to believe me. Go and talk and ask for witnesses, which is right in a trial situation. But Jesus is not denying anything. He is owning everything here in stark contrast to Peter. So look there at verse 22 then. Or verse 21. Jesus says, why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I said. Verse 22. And when he had said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him and said, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if I rightly, why do you strike me? In other words, Jesus is saying, Give me a fair trial here. This officer here, this idea of struck, has the idea of kind of an open handed hit, but a strong hit. And so it strikes, strikes Jesus across his face. And Jesus looks up and says, if I've done something right or wrong, then let's get to that point. Tell me what I've done wrong. 
Slapping me is not the way to deal with me in a trial. Deal with what I've done wrong. But if I've said it all right, then why do you strike me? Jesus says, give me a fair trial. This is not a fair trial. Jesus ultimately knows what's happening here. He's not backing down from what he knows is going to happen. So back in John. Again, verse 23, it says, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? So Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now we kind of have, you know, we used to have, you know, it's not so much now, but in the shows we used to watch, they'd say, meanwhile, back at the barn, right? Or meanwhile, you know, there's these two scenes that are kind of being played out at roughly the same time. And so you have that introduction of Peter. This is why, this is why it's kind of unique to John. This setup and how they talk about the denials of Peter is set up differently in John. John sets up this contrast because ultimately he is talking about who the identity of Jesus is. And we're going to see that being played out here. So now we have the introduction of Peter and his first denial. Then we have Jesus who is questioned, who is drilled illegally at this time. He is struck. And now we have verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? Notice, notice the tone of that again. You are not one of those. It's, kinda, it's almost the same thing as what the, the, the servant said earlier, the doorkeeper. You're not, you're not one of those, are you? And again, Peter says, no, no, I'm not. He says, I am not. Verse 26, now, now notice, now notice here in verse 26, one of the slaves of the high priest being a relative, relative cut off. Evidence of what he's done. I'm sure that was in his mind before when the servant girl was asking about him. You're not one of those disciples. No, no. Remember, he's around the officers that, that helped arrest Jesus. And so now here, relative one, this is unique to John, a relative of the one whose ear was cut off, says, yeah, I recognize you. Remember, they're all gathered around the fire. You know, imagine kind of a, a dramatic scene where, where Peter is trying to warm his hands because it's cold out night. It's the middle of the night. He's, he's warming his hands there in the cold uh, desert. And, and across the way, you know, there's some other people, the, the relative, the officers, they're all kind of gathering around this, this same fire, uh, you know, and Peter's kind of there, you know, wanting to be warm. He wants to be close enough to Jesus because he wants to know what's going to happen. But he needs to be far enough from Jesus so that he doesn't get involved with it. You ever feel like that in your life? Where you want to be close enough to Jesus to receive the forgiveness of sins? Where you want to be close enough to Jesus because you want to receive the blessings from him? But when you're, you're confronted about it, you kind of want to distance yourself about it because you're not one of those Christians, are you? That's what Peter is doing right here. He wants to be close enough to understand and know what's happening with Jesus, but far enough where he's removed where he can deny him. And so as Peter is warming his hand, maybe the, fly, the fire, someone throws in some more fuel to the fire, the fire perks up, and there across the flame, from across the flame is the relative of the person whose ear has been, sli been cut off. And he sees Peter. Hey, I know you. Aren't, you. aren't you the one? Aren't you? You're one of the disciples. Now notice in this, notice here in verse 26, one of the slaves of the high priest being a relative of the one whose ear Peter cut off said, did I not see you in the garden with him? Now see, this is a negative question, but what's it, what is it, its expectation? This is now, this is more positive. The first two, the first two were kind of questioned in, in a way where it was an, an encouraging a negative response. This, this is encouraging a positive response. 
Did I, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again, and immediately the rooster crowed. Now, in the other gospel accounts, we see the response of Peter. He's crying. He feels horrible. Why does he feel horrible? Let's turn back to John 13. John 13. Verse 36. John 13, verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. That statement alone is heavy. Where I'm going now, you will not follow. You see, what we're going to discover here is, G or is Peter cannot follow or will not follow an imprisoned Savior. But he will follow one that's died for him. And so Simon Peter, again, verse 36, said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peace, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay your, down your life for me? Will you? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. And so in that moment, after Peter denies Jesus a third time, with the relative who's seen him, who had, knows the evidence, probably has talked to his relative who lost that ear and then had it healed. He saw everything. You know, sometimes it's, it's easy for us to distance ourselves from people that don't know us. But it can be a little more difficult to lie to those who do. But here, Peter does that. And so now, back in John chapter 18, verse 27... It says, Peter then denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Now, as I pointed out, in Mark, it talks about how Peter's response is, is he, he cries. He makes, he makes oaths. He, he, can, he kind of makes some horrible statements, and he's, he's horribly distraught over what he realized he has just done. But John doesn't bring that out. Because John's focus he wants it to be on what Jesus has been doing and what Jesus predicted. Going back to who Jesus is. Who could know that? Who could know with such details that you're going to deny me three times and guess what? After that third time, there's going to be a rooster that's going to crow. Could, could you imagine hearing that as Peter? I mean, that's ridiculous. Remember, he just, I, I, would, I would die for you. I would die for you, Jesus. Would you? And to make kind of what would seem to appear to Peter as somewhat outlandish. Deny you three times? And then there's going to be a rooster that crows? See, we get back to that question that, that John keeps asking us is, who are you seeking? Who are you seeking? Peter's not going to follow the one that he was seeking. Think about that. Peter was thinking that Jesus was going to be what? Physical king. A real king on earth. Right? A real king on earth who was going to get rid of the Roman Empire. And when it came down to it, that wasn't the leader that Peter could follow. Because that's not who Jesus was. Peter wasn't going to follow an imprisoned king. A beaten king. See, that's when we have the beauty of this story that unfolds because it doesn't end here. In the other accounts, we also see where there is eye contact made with Jesus and Peter. 
which sends Peter ultimately into that emotional turmoil that he experienced. So turn with me then to John chapter 21. Remember the words of Jesus when not only he said, you're going to deny me three times and there's going to be a rooster that crows, but also he tells Peter, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me. Because you see, when we encounter the Son of God, when we encounter Jesus, not only do we encounter his power, not only do we encounter uh, his authority, not only do we encounter who he is as the Son of God, that he is all-knowing, we not, but we also encounter his love and his grace. So look at John chapter 21. And look at verse 15. John 21, verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, I almost get the idea here that he's kind of pulled Peter aside. He kind of turns and, and they're kind of having a, a small kind of private conversation that is, that is a distinct from the other disciples kind of being there. And he said to Simon Peter, verse 15, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. Now remember, at this, point, at this point, Jesus has been resurrected. Jesus has been crucified. He has died. He has been buried. And now he's been resurrected. And he is now sitting across from Peter. This Peter that was horribly distraught after he denied Jesus three times. And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. And then verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time. Now, there's a lot else going on here, but the sake for the lesson and what I'm doing, trying to do with John 18, we're going, only going to touch upon a couple of things here. But why do you, why do you think Simon Peter, why do you think Peter is, is grieved at this point when Jesus has asked him his, this third time? Do you think maybe perhaps he's thinking about what he did in the fire? Do you think that's on his mind and on his heart? If I, if I read 1 Peter and I read 2 Peter and I read about the grace that Peter continually brings up, I would say yes, he was. He was thinking about that. Peter talks a lot about grace in his letters, which I think is because he knows what grace looks like firsthand. He received that firsthand from Jesus, that grace that we all desperately need. And so, again, verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. Notice, I know you know me. You know that I love you. What is he saying when he says, I know you know all things? Has Peter's understanding of Jesus been elevated? Do you think Peter understands a little bit more now about who Jesus really is when he says, I know you know all things? Because who knows all things? Who knows all things? God, right? Peter Peter is making the connection here with all of these things, just like we need to do as well. And he says, he says, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And then notice, let me finish out here and we'll close. Verse 18, I'm going to be thinking about, remember when Jesus said, follow me, but you will be able to follow. Verse, me, follow me later. Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand. He's talking to Peter. This is Jesus. This is his conversation still from Jesus to Peter. You will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. 
What is Jesus telling him? He tells us in, John tells us in verse 19. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, what? Follow me. Peter said before, I'll die for you, Lord. I'm ready to die for you. And Peter's, or Jesus says, will you? Will you really? Peter now fully understands in his understanding who Jesus is. I know you. You know all things. You know all things, Jesus. You know all things. So Jesus tells him ultimately how he is going to die for him. And he reaches out to him, and it's almost like he takes his hand. You know, it, yeah, this picture, and this is me just reading between the lines and stuff like that, but it's almost like, now you're ready. Now you're ready to follow me. Peter was not ready and could not follow. He could not follow his concept of who Jesus is. But he could follow who Jesus was and still is today. Once he raised from the grave. That is the same Savior that we're we have the opportunity to follow today. It is not a dead king. It is not an imprisoned teacher. It is not a crucified man who, who, who's been put to death and is never going to live again. We serve and can follow a risen Savior. And that's the beauty of this kind of small story, if you will, in this big picture that we kind of see throughout the Gospels is because ultimately Jesus' resurrection is for each and every one of us. Every single individual in here has the opportunity to follow Jesus. And I think that's why John and, and others give us these small little moments with various different people because it's not a big picture thing. Jesus wanting to come in and have a relationship with each and every one of us. You, and you, and you, and you. Anybody here like Peter? What's well, it that we follow, that we follow a Savior who wants to give to us? You know why we may, we may have made denials. We may have denied Jesus. We, have made, we may have done some stupid things. Maybe we've been drawn into the crowd. Maybe we've been drawn into some of the culture that we experience in this life. And in doing so, we kind of deny Jesus. We deny that he's our savior. We deny that he is, we are in a relationship with him. And maybe go, someone go, yeah, don't you go to church? Didn't I see you pray? That? Didn't I, you know, whatever those questions are. And, and what's our response? But know that if grace can be given to Peter and the love and forgiveness can be given to Peter, it can be given to everybody in this room, regardless of what has happened. Regardless. If you're struggling with sin, if you're struggling with a life where you are denying Christ, Maybe, maybe you're not sure how close you want to get. You're kind of un maybe, you know, you're unsure about church stuff. You know, maybe you're unsure about this Christianity stuff. But you, you kind of are interested, but you're not sure. Well, sit down and, and, and open this book with us, and we'd be happy to teach you what Jesus says. And you can see for yourself what he has to offer you. And he has to offer you a life of forgiveness, a life of grace, a life of love, and a life of peace if you will only give your turmoil, your pain, and your sins to him. Confessing him and then being forgiven. We are immersed into a watery grave. We are immersed and we become united with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And we are raised up in a new life as his brother and as children of God. 
If you've not yet done that, please speak to someone here before you leave. We have this front row. We don't do it much anymore, but if you are struggling with someone, something this morning and you would like to tell us so we can start praying for you now, you can come up to this front uh, pew and let us know as together we stand and sing.